Joining us to talk about what he's seeing in the markets right now is Tom Lee. He is Fundstrat Global Advisors, managing partner, and a CNBC contributor. Tom, it's weird. We are sitting very near all-time highs, and, and yet it does feel like there is some nervousness in the market at this point. A lot of this is coming from hotter-than-expected inflation numbers, stronger-than-expected jobs reports, and manufacturing numbers, the ISM, that was better than anticipated, too. That's got people wondering if the Fed is actually going to be able to cut rates this week. Are you unnerved by any of this? Um, I think this coming Wednesday, Becky, will really answer a lot of questions, because I, I think you've summed it up well. Investors have been grappling with this idea that can the Fed be in a position to, you know, reduce real rates if we've got good economic growth? Because what does that mean for inflation? And this coming Wednesday is March CPI. I think it's going to be the first clean CPI report of this year. You know, it won't have any residual seasonality. We're expecting that to be a pretty good report, lower than expected inflation. And I think it's going to help investors get to this place where we can have pretty good growth in the economy. Uh, there's some slack in the labor markets, but inflation's falling fast enough for the Fed to, to actually cut rates this year. And, of course, that'd be great for stocks. I, I know you'd been telling people kind of buy on the dip, not that there's been much of a dip if you're just talking about a pullback of a few percent. Um, does it matter if the Fed cuts rates or not, if the economy's really strong anyway? Will earnings be able to justify the valuations at this point? Um. I think the Fed being supportive of the economy, so managing the business cycle is the most important thing. In the last two years, the Fed was fighting inflation and therefore hawkish. That was tough for equities. But if we're in a mode where the Fed doesn't know how many cuts it needs to make, but it actually wants to support the business cycle, that's good for stocks. So I don't think you need to have three rate cuts. You, you could even have a, a good scenario where the Fed only cuts once. But if the Fed's in a position where they feel they need to actually raise interest rates, that, that'd be bad for stocks. Hey, Tom, hold, hold on just a moment. We've got some breaking news. We'd actually like to get your reaction, so if you don't mind listening in. Uh, we just have some news uh, literally crossing this moment, uh, which is that Jamie Dimon's uh, J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon's J.P. Morgan uh, is uh, publishing his annual letter to shareholders. And we want to bring you uh, some of the news that's in this letter uh, a highly watched letter annually. Uh, Diamond writes the following. He says that despite the, quote, unsettling landscape, war in the Middle East uh, and Ukraine, uh, growing geopolitical tensions in China and polarized electorate here in the U.S., that the U.S. economy, he thinks, uh, continues to be resilient with consumers still spending. He says the market seems to be pricing in a 70 to 80 percent chance of a soft landing, but Diamond thinks the odds are, quote, a lot lower. He cites persistent inflationary pressures, including what he says are, quote, ongoing fiscal spending, remilitarization of the world, restructuring of global trade and capital uh, needs of the new green economy. Another major theme in the letter is artificial intelligence. Diamond writing uh, that the consequences will be extraordinary. He says J.P. Morgan Chase has grown uh, its AI organization, quote, materially with more than 2,000 uh, machine learning experts or data scientists now on the payroll. Diamond also issuing a warning, quote, we may be entering one of the most treacherous geopolitical eras since World War II. He said he's also concerned about the large deficit supported by quantitative easing. I will say on, on the World War II piece, he says, when terrible events uh, happen, we tend to overstate uh, or overestimate the effects that they will have on the global economy. Recent events, however, may very well be creating risks that could eclipse anything hmm. since World War II. We should not take them lightly. I mean, that's, um, that's the risk manager side of him. Right. But, but it, it's interesting. Jamie Dimon, I think, is somebody who's always been fairly optimistic about the United States and the economy. His concern about some of these geopolitical uh, uh, events is one that is echoed by other people who are generally pretty optimistic about things, right. if you talk to a Warren Buffett or someone, too. The letter generally, I should say, is what I would describe as cautiously optimistic. Yeah. yeah I think tonally, we, we, we've just hit on what I would describe as the news pieces in the letter. Right. Um, but I think tonally, it's, it's, it's an upbeat letter. He's talking about AI. 
uh, spends a bit of time. This is uh, 20 years now, uh, 20 year anniversary uh, since the bank won JP Morgan Chase uh, deal, which actually put him in charge of the company. Talks really about the growth of the bank. It's now the largest bank by market cap in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, goes through a whole number of other uh, pieces to it, management lessons and other things. It is a worthy read. Uh, by the way, but only, there's only a few CEOs who actually really write their own letters without worrying about lawyers and lots of other people going through yep. and reading it and telling them what they can say, what they can't, actually writing it for them in a lot of cases. I mean, Jamie Dimon, obviously a huge one, Warren Buffett, Jeff Bezos always wrote a very um, straightforward letter from that you could yep. tell was written by him with their voices. I think Larry Fink's letter this year was mm -hmm. up there with that, where he wrote about yep. his parents uh, at the very top of the entire letter. Um, that's why these letters are so interesting. And I think the tone and his tone on the markets is one that he's been kind of consistent about over right. the last year or so, and that is the concern about a soft landing not necessarily being as certain as the market expectations seem to be and concern about higher inflation. Maybe mm -hmm. we can ask Tom about that right well, now. Well, Tom's been the bull, though. Yeah. Tom's been on the other side of this, Tom. What do you think? Um, I think Jamie's doing his shareholders uh, justice at, because they, they want to hear from him about all the concerns out there. I, I think he does a great job of detailing all the things that could go wrong. But at the end of the day, when when it comes to markets, I think markets tend to price concerns very quickly. I mean, I think I think that's really been the concern for the last two years is, is a hard landing. And now that inflationary pressures are easing at a time when consumers don't have a lot of leverage, there's all this, you know, there's six trillion of cash on the sidelines. And inflation, we don't really know how quickly it's going to fall, but our bet at Fundstrat is that it's going to fall pretty quickly means uh, some of the concerns he listed about a hard landing are because of sticky inflation. If it, if, and if it's softer, I, I think we're going to have quite a good economy. Is, is this a two-pronged outlook on the, on the economy and the markets, though, Tom? Is inflation the one big issue? And if Wednesday proves that it's a hotter than anticipated or hotter than expected CPI number, would you change your ideas about what that means for both of those things for the long term or for the year? Um, that's right. I, I think if inflation, because March is going to be the first clean CPI report, we know out of Europe, they've come in pretty soft. They've come in better than expected. If it comes in higher than expected, then I think it raises the question that the inflation is quite stubborn and getting to that from three to two is going to be difficult. On the other hand, if it is a soft report and we think it's the probabilities favor below a 0.3, that's consensus core 0.3, Mm -hmm. I think it's going to change a lot of people's minds that inflation may not be that stubborn. Yeah. Um, you have been telling people to buy, or you yourself have been buying um, on any dips? And, and by dips, we're not talking 5 or 10% drops. You're talking 2% drops, and you'd be buying in, into the market? That's right. I think that there's many reasons that we still think there's gas in the tank in this rally. Part of it is that we do think the inflation trajectory is a is on a glide path lower than consensus expects. The second is I think there's too much caution out there. You know, when you look at prime brokerage borrowings or basically leverage in the market, it's still below where it was in October 2021. There's still six trillion of cash on the sidelines. In our conversations with clients, they're, they're still quite cautious. So as long as investors are top calling and are really looking at the world half empty, I think stocks can still rise on this wall of worry.